I agree that they must be least probable by natural causes, but no one ever claimed that Jesus rose by natural causes. The claim is that God raised Jesus from the dead, <clears throat> and if God exists and wanted to raise Jesus, there's no reason why this shouldn't be the most probable explanation. The difficulty for historians is we can't know whether God wanted to raise Jesus. And so we have to leave this uh, in terms of prior, uh, prior probability to be settled by which hypothesis fulfills the criteria best of explanatory scope, power, etc. This is how we determine probability and not according to these theological speculations that Bart has to import into his uh, history prior to assessing any of the evidence. When we do look at the explanatory scope, power, etc., we do find that the resurrection is the most probable explanation. If we look at it purely according to how well it fulfills that, uh, those criteria, rather than the theological and philosophical ideas that go along with it. <clears throat> now at our fourth checkpoint, we looked at applying method. We talked about the historical bedrock, uh, those three facts. And Bart says that these are not rock solid facts. But remember, these are things that he admitted to in his opening statement. Um, or I'm sorry, in his writings. He admits that Jesus' death by crucifixion is one of the most certain facts of history. He admits that it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead and that Paul, um, he says <clears throat> of Paul, there is no doubt that Paul believed that he saw Jesus' real but glorified body raised from the dead. So it's this transformed physicality of the body that is raised from the dead. <clears throat> so he believes with the, on these three facts right here and, and counts them as facts. He says, well, you can't have, or um, just because you don't have, just because you have crucifixion, these were common, it doesn't mean a resurrection. I never said it did, but you can't have a resurrection without a death now, can you? And so that's why I said Jesus' death by crucifixion. <clears throat> In terms of the appearances to the disciples and the appearance to Paul, the reason I distinguish them is because not only was it his friends who believed that he rose from the dead, but also a sworn enemy someone who would be the equivalent of a modern Osama bin Laden, who, uh, I mean, imagine Osama bin Laden, he comes out of the, uh, appears before his group someday, and you hear all these gunshots and yelling, and he comes out and he says, brothers, I'm here to tell you, I was in a cave the other day, <clears throat> and I was praying with my colleagues, and a loud voice bellowed throughout the cave, and a bright light came in the cave and said, Osama, Osama, why are you persecuting me? He said, well, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you were persecuting, and so forth. And I'm here to tell you today, Muslim brothers and sisters, that Jesus is Lord, and we need to follow him. And they pelt him with stones. That's the big difference between the disciples believing and Paul believing. <clears throat> now, Professor Ehrman makes an issue out of the parallels, but I don't think that these are very um, effective. For example, he mentions Apollonius of Tiana. Um, what we need to do is we need to compare the sources, like are there early sources, multiple sources, eyewitness sources, embarrassing sources, are there any plausible naturalistic explanations? And when we look at Apollonius of Tiana versus Jesus, we say that Apollonius fails in every single one of these categories, whereas Jesus passes. <clears throat> the earliest account that we have, 125 years after the death of Apollonius. Um, we don't have multiple sources. We only have the one source. Yes, there were others, but we don't have them. And we could add more sources about Jesus if we're going to go that way. Eyewitnesses, we don't have that <clears throat> with Apollonius. Embarrassing, no, because Philostratus, his only biographer, was very pro-Apollonius. In fact, there are reasons to suspect that this was uh, perhaps propaganda meant to um, answer the Christian view. So there are pl plausible naturalistic explanations but the thing with uh, Jesus, resurrection uh, passes in every one of these categories. Regarding Romulus, he mentioned that, well, we're not even certain of his death. That's not mentioned in the historical records. So that's why death is important. We do at least have an apparition of the dead. And um, this is something that Professor Ehrman mentioned, and he said, well, Mike uh, just uh, hasn't studied the literature on this, and I have. In fact, I noticed the book uh, Resurrecting Jesus by Dale Allison. I wrote the review for a review of biblical literature on that book and in fact hosted 
a panel discussion at uh, AAR and EPS this past fall where Professor Allison gave a paper on his studies about apparitions from the dead and it was responded by Gary Habermas, William Lane Craig, and Stephen Davis. I think apparitions of the dead actually occur. I have no problems with that. I have a friend in Virginia Beach named Pat Ferguson who's told me of uh, an amazing corroborated account of an apparition of the dead. Just the other day I was talking to my friend Bill Johnson down in Atlanta, Georgia who had an apparition of the dead just last week and he's had them before and some of these are corroborated. So I do believe in these, but in no case do these people go back and check the person's tomb. They don't think that it's a bodily resurrected of a transformed corpse. <clears throat> so um, I do believe that sometimes you have these apparitions of the dead. I don't have problems with that. In terms of the Virgin Mary in 1968-69, I haven't really looked into this, I must confess. So I can't really comment on this. If there were 10,000 or plus eyewitnesses to this, I would just say that if I were to look in it, I would have to weigh the hypotheses. I'm not Catholic, so my bias to begin with would be to say that these, there must be a naturalistic explanation. <clears throat> but as a historian, I would have to be open to this. I would have to weigh hypotheses and be open to a phenomena going on. Could I prove that it's the Virgin Mary? No. Could I prove that this was uh, perhaps a supernatural event? Well, maybe. Maybe I'd have to be open to that as a historian if there were no plausible naturalistic explanations and if this happened in a context that was charged with religious significance, which I'd be happy to unpack if uh, Professor Herman would like me to. <clears throat> Regarding the weighing of hypotheses, he brought up the wishful thinking hypothesis and he stated what he thought happened, but he didn't defend it. And it's easy to just state, I could say Jesus rose from the dead, but unless I give evidence for it, it falls on deaf ears. So I'm still waiting to hear Professor Ehrman's explanation for that. Again, it lacks explanatory scope, power, and may possess an ad hoc component. Um, regarding the, uh, he says, if God didn't do it with the resurrection, who did? Well, as historians, as I mentioned in my uh, first rebuttal, we may have to leave that as a question mark, but that doesn't justify us saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead just because we, it, we can't stomach the possibility that maybe a God did it. Um, I think that's doing history backward. And we have to divorce ourselves of our theological and philosophical presuppositions for the most part in terms of our beliefs about God when we are doing a historical investigation. Let me just give a real quick analogy. Let's say that during his next uh, rebuttal, Mark drops dead. I hope that doesn't happen, we'll say he does. And a couple of physicians come up and work on him, and the paramedics come in after an hour, they declare him dead. And at that point, Phil Roberts jumps up and says, uh, Bart, uh, God did this in order to show you that um, uh, your journey from Christianity to agnosticism was wrongheaded. Now in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And at that moment, he opens his eyes and stands up. Well, maybe he would say, whoa, whatever happened, I don't understand what happened there, but it wasn't a miracle because we can't know that. And I would say, no, I think it was a miracle. Um, maybe we can't say anything about the God who did that as historians, but we could say that a miracle has happened here. Um, so in conclusion, I, I think I'd just say that I think my case that historians can prove that Jesus rose from the dead still stands and Bart's um, contentions to the contrary continue to fail under critical scrutiny. Well, thank you, Mike, for those clarifications. And uh, uh, I think Mike would agree, these debates get increasingly difficult because what you're tempted to do is to give a point-by-point -point refutation. And uh, frankly, it's kind of boring to do it that way, but that's sort of what you're stuck with. So, uh, so it goes. So um, yeah, so let me answer just a few of his points. Um, uh, I am insisting that he doesn't have three facts. He's got one fact. Uh, that, the, that there are people who claim to see Jesus alive afterwards. He says that his first point that Jesus was crucified is necessary because if he wasn't crucified, he wouldn't be raised from the dead. That's true. Yes, right, okay, 